that we could come here and gather to hear your word, to sit at your feet and be taught by you the things that you make so clear to us, Lord, the things you want us to do, the places you want us to be, the people you want us to see. Father, we're so grateful that you use us. We're so grateful that you bless us. And Lord, we just ask right now that you pour your spirit upon this room, that it may be filled to overflowing, that we all may get the power of the Holy Spirit, not only to speak in power of your word, but so that we can walk worthy of you, Lord. And as we see in the book of Exodus tonight what happened some 3,400 years ago, Lord, we just ask that the example that you put before us, we may learn and not have to look at it or learn it again, Lord, that you may teach us through your Spirit. And Father, we just devote this time to you, Lord, and we ask that you be glorified in everything that we say and do. And we thank you for being here tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> as we've been chugging along through the book of Exodus, uh, we come to a point here where it's, it's been almost 40 days. It's time for Moses to get off the mountain and go down and start what God was telling him. Now, remember... God gave the Ten Commandments as he spoke it from the mountain. Then Moses went up. He, sp he spent six days at the, at halfway up the mountain in the cloud, or just short of the cloud. And then after, on the seventh day, he went on to the mountain, and he's been there for almost 40 days right now. And so what God has given him, what he has shown him, and what he has told him, is um, since he's been up there, and it tells him about, tells Moses, now go down and get an offering in chapter 25 for the sanctuary. Make sure that the people give it because they want to give it. Out of, out of their hearts they give it, willingly, not unwillingly. He doesn't want what they don't want to give. So then as we continued on in chapter 25, we saw the dimensions of the Ark of the Testimony. We saw that it was overlaid with what? Gold. Gold. Very good. You guys have been doing your homework. We saw the size of it, and God was very precise. It was wood overlaid in gold. It said that it had what on it? Poles to carry it, right? Why? Because nobody can touch it because it's holy. Okay? It also had something on the top. There were two angels overlooking the mercy seat. Exactly. Good job. So then from there, it went to the table of showbread. And as you walked into the temple, to the right uh, was the table of showbread. It gave us the dimensions, and it was made of gold. Remember, everything inside the temple itself was made of gold. Outside of the temple, it was bronze, okay? Because anything that came into the temple had to be holy. Anything outside is where you had the sin offering, you had the, the laver, and where, you, where you put the water in to wash. Somebody's been giving me a hard time about whether it's laver or laver, so I'm going to switch off just so that everybody's happy. So anyway, uh, the table is showbread. Then there was, a, on the other side was the gold lampstand. Yeah, it was him. <clears throat> you had the golden lampstand, and you had the, the seven bowls, and, uh, and, and, and it gave you the, the size, and it was made of gold. Okay. Uh, then into chapter 26, it told about the, uh, the tabernacle, so the tent, and what went around it, the size of it, how long it was, how tall it was, the colors that were in it. Of course, the outside of the tabernacle was all white, but it had clasps so of bronze and of silver and of gold. It had a gate that was multicolored. It was what? Blue, purple, and scarlet, right? Red, all right? And that was the only opening, the gate that you went into was the only opening that you could get into it. Um, then as we moved along through 
chapter 26. Um, let's see here. Oops. We went to chapter 27, and it was the, the altar, the, the bronze altar that sat outside, which was the first thing as you came into the tabernacle, the first thing that was there was the altar where they burned the sacrifices. It went through and told about the, the court, how big the court was and what was to be done there. Then it was uh, the care of the lampstand. In chapter 28, it, it, uh, God told Moses the garments for Aaron and his sons. And it told of the breastplate, of the ephod, of the robe, a tunic, a turban, a sash. And he told them how to make them. And then he gave the dimensions of the ephod and how to make that and how to connect it. And the breastplate, which each stone uh, representing a tribe of Israel. The, the, the two onyx stones on his shoulders that would connect the breastplate. That, I mean, that would connect the ephod together and hook the breastplate to. And it had the names of six tribes on one and six tribes on the other. Uh, then he went through and told about the breastplate and told the size of everything that was on there. Then he told of the, uh, of the robes of the, of the sons of the priest. And um, then in chapter 29, he told Moses that he, how to consecrate Aaron and his sons, that how they were going to take a, a bull and two rams and sacrifice them for a sin offering, that they were going to wash them and cleanse them and consecrate them. And then uh, in verse 38 of chapter 29, he, he gave us the daily offerings that they were supposed to do a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening every day. Uh, chapter 30 got into the altar of incense and he told them what it was made of. It was made of what? Gold inside. It was inside, so everything was gold that's inside. Anything outside would be bronze. Uh, told them of the ransom money and, the, and uh, what the, didn't, never gave a size for the bronze laver, but he did tell what it should look like also gave them the holy anointing oil and told them the recipe of this that they were supposed to, to use to anoint and, and the incense and the oil that they would burn. And it was never to be replicated. It was only to be for the, either the lampstand or in the case of the incense that, that they made were the incense or the prayers up to the Lord. So <clears throat> as we get to chapter 31, we're going to kind of shift gears it, Moses is still on the mountain for chapter 31, and God's still telling him things, and then he's going to come down off the mountain in verse 32. So all these things that have been told, they haven't been implemented yet, but they're going to be shortly. Um, so as we pick up in chapter 31, and in verse 1, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. So it's kind of interesting. Here the Lord says to Moses, I have called by name this guy, Bezalel. His name actually is translated in the shadow of God. So what a nice name to have. And it says that he was the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Verse 3 and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. So God is saying, this guy, this, uh, this guy that I have called, I have filled him with the Holy Spirit. To do what? To do this work. He gave them what? Wisdom. He gave them understanding. He gave them knowledge in all manner of workmanship. This was a spirit-filled construction worker. Now, it's interesting to note here or to look at is God called this man, whether he know how to, knew how to do any of this stuff or not, we don't know. But what we do know, that he filled him with the Spirit of God so that he would know all things, especially to pertaining to this. And God gave him the wisdom, the understanding, knowledge, 
in the manner of workmanship. So he gave him that knowledge to do this work. This was the guy that was going to be the lead to do all of this work. This guy don't know it yet, but he's going to find out. Hey, I got all these gifts. Where'd they come from? Well, we know where they come from. And see, this is just like God. As he filled him with his spirit, he equipped him. And it's just like you and me. If God calls you to do something, believe it or not, he's going to equip you. No matter how hard you kick and fuss, God's still going to equip you. And no matter how many times you think that he hasn't done it or he's not going to do it, he's going to do it because he said he would do it. So you know one thing when God calls you. What's that? He's going to equip you. If he doesn't equip you, maybe you weren't called. But see, he's calling this man to do this work, this particular work. And in verse 6, it says, And I indeed, I, have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ashamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. So there is a group of these people, these artisans that God has gifted to do this work, to make these things, to sew all this stuff. There wasn't 100,000 ladies behind a veil with a bunch of linen tr trying to sew sew this. Now, I remember, I don't know what they did before, but my grandmother used to have this sewing machine where you push this pedal, and it would turn the, the bobbin, is that it, or something, and the needle would go up and down, and you should sew. And I remember this because when I was a little kid, she used to make me go down on her knees, because she was really short, and uh, so it was a long stretch for her, and I'd have to take this thing, and I'd do it by hand, and just keep, okay, go faster, go faster, go faster. So there wasn't a whole lot of those ladies. It was all these artisans that were gifted by God to do this work. Now, this guy, uh, Aholiab, has a really interesting name. His name means Father's Tent, which is kind of interesting, because can you imagine naming your son Hey, Father's Tent, come over here. That's kind of an odd name, but it's very fitting because he's going to be working on what? His Father's Tent. Cool. I wonder if they realized that when he was born. So he's got these gifted artesium. They have, they ha it says here that God has put wisdom in their hearts of all the gifted artesians that they may make all that I have commanded you. Now, uh, flip over to Exodus 36 real quick, which is a couple of pages to the right. And in verse 1 of chapter 36, it says, And Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artesian in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artesian in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. So God here, and this is, this is four chapters later uh, where they're going to start this. God put this in their heart to do this, gave them the wisdom and the knowledge to do this. Verse 7, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony. Did I skip a verse? No. No. The tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the labor and its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests, and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. So God is telling them, look, all this stuff, these guys that I have equipped, that I have put my spirit into, 
that I have given them wisdom and knowledge and understanding. They are going to build all these things that I have been showing you these last 40 days. That I have been telling you these last 40 days. And we, now we go to verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now I have a question for you. Did you, did you see why it says here, my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign. It's a sign of what? It's a sign between you and me, between God and Israel, that throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now this is very interesting. You remember uh, way back in Genesis, or in, uh, in Exodus, when they crossed over the Red Sea, and they're wandering through the desert, and they were all complaining about not having food. Now, they had the food that they had taken out of Egypt, which was the unleavened bread that God told them to make. So they had that for a while, but now they're starting to run out of food, and they started complaining. And they complained, and they complained, and Moses got frustrated. And God did what? Did he slap them around? No. What did God do? He sent them bread from heaven. He sent them manna. Now, it said around 600,000 men left Egypt, so everybody kind of figures, oh, there's two to three million people. Let's go on the low end. Let's say there was two million people. You have two million people out in the desert with no food, and God sent them food from heaven. That's 40 tons a day of manna. But do you remember what he told them? He said, go out and collect it in the morning and eat it. Don't let any last. And then he told them, go out and collect it every day for how many days? Six days. And on the seventh day, they were to rest, were they not? They were not to go out and get their food. Why? Because God was going to take care of them. And he did. Not only then, but he's going to take care of them for the 40 years that they're going to wander around in the desert because of their stupidity, because of their lack of faith, because of their disobedience. They're going to wander in the desert, and God's going to feed them every day. And their clothes isn't going to, aren't going to wear out, and their shoes won't wear out. Because that's God. But it's not just for 40 years, is it? It's been since the beginning of time for us. The beginning of time that God started with his plan of redemption, knowing that we were going to sin. Knowing that we would need a Savior. So here, if you start with Adam, we're about 5,800 years. 58, 59, somewhere in there. If you start charting from Adam and get to today, it's right around that, that time. Interesting. So for 5,700 years, God has waited. God has been faithful. God has directed. God has given us the Holy Spirit. And most of all, God saved us waited all this time to save us. Now, you know, I don't know how, I, I'm going to say 100 because I don't think anybody's over 100 here. Well, Quinn, I'm, okay, never mind. But, um, <clears throat> calm down. So, um, anyway, uh, he's not, he's a lot younger than that. But if, if God would have came 100 years ago, where would we be? We'd be in a lot of trouble. But I'm glad that God waited so that we could be here in this time frame, this time in history, to maybe see the very last days. So that maybe we could be the ones to be raptured 
be the part of the church that gets raptured so that the last seven years can start and this nonsense can end. Well, God made this Sabbath as a sign. We have a sign too. It's called the Holy Spirit that lives within us. It's called the tomb is empty. That's our sign. But see, he gave them this sign between them throughout their generations. And in verse 14, it says, You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Now, what doesn't that say if, if you think about something in the New Testament that Jesus did? It said that you couldn't work, but Jesus wasn't working when he healed that man, was he? He wasn't working. So does it say, oh, you can't do good works? No, he's saying you can't do works. Why? Because he knew. He knew that they would. Just like when he gave the manna, there were people that went out there and tried to save, take extra so that they had it for the next day. But God provided it. it God provided that day for them to rest because he rested on the seventh day after his creation. So he's telling them, Rest, six days rest. There was also something about six years. Six years you could be a servant. On the seventh year you have to let, let them go, right? That the land should be tilled, should be planted and harvested for six years. And in the seventh year you're to let it sit and you're to not work for a year on that land. But they would do it anyway. Actually, today, they kind of try to get away with it. They actually hire somebody to come in to do it, and then that's not like, I, I, I didn't work. I hired them to do it. It's your land. But see, Israel, Jerusalem, Judea, the kings, they didn't follow this either, did they? And what happened? God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in, destroy the temple, which they worshiped more than God, and that's why God allowed him, them to destroy it. So he lets Nebuchadnezzar come in and take over the temple, 70 years, or, or take them into captivity so that the land could rest for 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, then they could go back to the land, which they, some of them did, most of them didn't. Um, and the women are going through Nehemiah right now. You guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? How they just kind of left the land, and Nehemiah cried and prayed so that they could go back and rebuild the temple. Now, the problem was that they were worshiping these structures and not God. That's what lead God to say that he was sick of their sacrifices. He just wanted their heart. Just like today. If we sit here today and we think of the good works that we do are more important then the fellowship that we have with God, we're mistaken. We are mistaken. Because our fellowship is most important to God. He could get anybody to do the work, but he's going to use you to bless you, but not if you're doing the work for the wrong reason. Do you understand how much God's value in your heart is to him? Do we understand that? 
Sometimes I don't think we do. He wants your heart. The rest of you, he don't care about. He don't care that I look like this. I don't know why, but he doesn't. But he wants my heart. And it's the same for everyone here. We all have failures and adequacies. We all have hang-ups. We all sin. We're all disobedient. He wants your heart. When we sin, he wants us to repent. Restore that relationship. Refresh it, as we're going to see just in a few verses. He wants to refresh you. Hanging on to that sin does no good. It has nothing to do with your salvation, but it has everything to do with your relationship with him. Okay, verse 16. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a, as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So work six days, and on the seventh day be rest and be refreshed. This is what he's telling them. This is good for them. This is what's best for them. Is it not? Does anybody disagree with that? That it's not best for them. It is best for them. 18, and when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So God, I, I really love to see this. this I, I don't, I, it's probably broken, but it would really be cool. It'd be a great archaeological archaeology find in the hand of God, you know. Can you imagine going to some guy and say, okay, check out this penmanship and, and uh, give us a reading on what this guy is all about. So, but here, with the finger of God writing on these tablets, the, the, uh, uh, the tablets of the testimony, the Ten Commandments. So he gives them to Moses, and in verse 32, so he's coming back down the mountain, or just getting ready to leave, in verse 32, cha uh, chapter 32, verse 1, it says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up, out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now, interesting. Who did they say brought them out of Egypt? Moses. Moses. So they were, these people were very impatient. They complained all the time, as we've seen, as we've gone through here, and you're going to really see it now. But uh, they were very impatient and they complained a lot. And this is what they were doing. They were whining, oh, this Moses, what happened to Moses? He's gone. God must have killed him, and uh, now what are we going to do? You need to make us some gods, okay? Because you know, hey, Lord, I prayed to you three times. You didn't answer. It's been two days since I prayed the third time, and you ain't, so I'm doing this on my own. Well, good luck with that. Hope you have fun. And that's how we are sometimes. Lord, I'm tired of waiting for you. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting. I actually, uh, well, I, I guess I could say I pray for my family all the time, so that's been a lot of years. Um, that's something the Lord told me about. I, I prayed for 16 months what he wanted to do. And it was hard. It was really hard. It was hard waiting. It was hard waiting because uh, it, it was, there was a lot of stuff going on. And, and uh, it would have been the easiest way, the easiest way uh, would have been just what they did in, in a sense. Uh, and that was to give up. But because I'm so stubborn, God wouldn't allow me to give up. And I just kept pushing on and on and on. And uh, so sometimes it's hard, and sometimes we, we, we lose faith. But, you know, 
I want to assure you the Lord is always faithful. Whatever it is that you got, whatever it is that you're going through, he is always faithful. And he will always pull you through it. He's always with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Never, 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 never. Now, Moses might have been up on this mountain, so it might have been kind of tough. Oh, yeah, we see this cloud and we see fire coming out of there. What happened to this Moses? He's been gone for 40 days. But see, God is always faithful, and God had told them that they were going to be in the land of milk and honey. So why turn away? And that's exactly what they did. They turned away from him. And now we go on to this next brain-dead guy. <clears throat> and Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So Aaron has a plan to satisfy the people, which is the worst thing he can do. Moses put him in charge of the people. He's going to be the high priest. God's going to consecrate him and set him up as the only one to come into the Holy of Holies one day a year. And here he is giving in, saying, hey, all right, here we go. Let's have some fun. Send me some earrings, and let's see what we can do. And what did he do? Verse 3, so all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molten calf. That then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So no longer Moses was the guy who brought it out. It was this molten calf that Aaron melted down and fashioned it with an engraving tool. So he obviously was a little talented. And he made a molten calf, which was kind of interesting because one of the main deities in Egypt was called Apis, who was a bull. So, which, if you remember, God destroyed that god. So here they are, and he makes this stuff. And did you notice here, this is your God. This is a man. How many times do we make man-made gods? And we're going to go on to see what Moses is going to do to this, but I want to tell you this now so that when I get there and I tell you again, you'll really hear it. Or maybe you'll hear it the first time and you can go like this when I say it the second time. But if we could take your God and burn it, it's not much of a God, is it? If we can take your God and we can crush it, it's not much of a God, is it? If we can take your God and dunk it into the water and hold it under, it's not much of a God. And if we can take your God and grind it into a powder and you drink it, it's not much of a God, is it? And as human beings, we sometimes have to see to believe. But God's saying that it's our faith, faith in him, the faith that he gives us to believe on him. So we don't need to have other gods. We don't need to see God. Verse 5. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Oh, man. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And it's kind of interesting here, he uses the word Jehovah. But see, he builds an altar to make a feast, to sacrifice. Verse 6, Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Uh, terrible. So they offered these burnt offerings. You, you notice there wasn't a sin offering there, was there? And the Lord said to Moses, go get down. I want you to 
watch this, these words here that God uses. And the Lord said to Moses, go get down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, when I read that, I thought to myself, sometimes when our kids, when they were growing up and uh, they would do something wrong, and my wife would say, your son, do you want to know what your son does? Wait a minute. When he does good things, he's your son, but when he does bad things, he's my son? Yeah. Well, when's he our son? Never. So it's kind of interesting, God using this, saying, your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt. They have corrupted themselves. Verse 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way, very quickly, which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molding calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. How devastating to God. How awful. Switch those roles around and you're a parent. And we all know this because some, some of us have some uh, kids that are kind of rogue sometimes. How heartbreaking it is. How heartbreaking it is. And, and God in this situation, now obviously God knows everything today, yesterday, and tomorrow. So he knew what was going to happen eventually, which we're going to see. He's going to kind of say it. But how heartbreaking for him, how long-suffering he is for his people. Because as he's going to go on to tell Moses here, I should just zap them right now. I'll start all over again. We'll just wipe them out. They broke the covenant. I didn't do it. He was within his right to do it. He was within his right to just eliminate them. But see, God's grace is greater. His grace is greater. He, he had multiple, multiple, multiple opportunities to eliminate any of us. How long would we have lasted in the church that we talked about last week in the book of Acts? Kind of hard to think about that, but sometimes we need to. Um, verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now I can tell you why they're stiff-necked, okay? Uh, 2011, I think. It might have been 10, anyway. 2010 or 11, I went to Egypt. And the first night, we slept at the YMCA in Cairo. And so you had basically this really narrow bed that was extremely hard. And uh, you got a sheet and a pillow. Now, you got a stiff neck from this pillow. Why? Because it was hard as a rock. In fact, I'd rather went out, if we were allowed outside, which we weren't, because the the radical Muslims were running around at the time and they wouldn't let us out. They actually locked us in. Um, and if I could have went outside and got a rock and put the pillowcase on it, it would have probably been better because this thing was hard. And I am not kidding you. I actually took a picture and I wish I could have found it. And it probably got wiped out somewhere or somewhere because I, I'm, anyway, it's probably there and I just can't find it. But I took this pillow, okay, and I set it on the bed Okay, so this would be like you're laying it down. So I flipped it this way, so it's like this. And I had it touching the headboard, or there was no headboard, but touching the wall and touching the bed, just the tip of it. And it stayed there. And it never moved for two days. You know how I know this? Because there was one empty bed, and I set it up like that to see if it would ever fall or give in or something. But it was hard as a rock. When you put your head on it, there was no dent. The dent was in your head from that hard pillow. Now, that's why the Jewish people are so stiff-necked, because they spent 400 years with them Egyptian linen pillows. <laughs> oh. 
Actually, it was funny because uh, the pastor I, uh, that I was with, um, Doug Borwick over in Ahwatukee, um, we, we still laugh about that to this day. So it's, it's, it, it, it was actually hilarious. That pillow was unbelievably hard. We didn't use them, needless to say. Okay. Verse 10. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. So he's telling them here, okay, I'm, I'm hot. Let my wrath burn. Let me consume them, and I'm going to just forget about them, and it's going to be you, Moses. I'm going to make you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? So he's passing the buck back to God with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Notice he didn't say Jacob. Your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. Interesting, very interesting here. It says that God was hot, was mad again. He was going to start over with, with uh, Moses and Moses defending the people saying, no, no, don't do this. Don't do this. You made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. They were your servants. You swore to them that you would give his descendants. But the thing is here, and, and what we need to look at here, and what's very important to see, God was never going to do this. God was never going to eliminate these people. Why? Why? Well, the line of Abraham turned out to be the line of Jesus Christ, didn't it? How could he reconcile the world back if he would have destroyed the nation of Israel? But see, here's the thing. This was not a test for God. This was a test for Moses. Because as you're going to see in just a few minutes when he, get down, when he gets down off the mountain, what he's going to do. This is a test for Moses because as they're wandering in the desert for 40 years and they're whining and complaining day after day after day after day and they come upon a rock and they don't have any water and they're whining and complaining and crying out to Moses, oh, you did uh, this to us. You should have left us in Egypt. Oh, the flesh pots, the garlics, the leeks, all this stuff that we had over there. Really, you whined and complained cried out to the Lord to free you, and he did. But as they're whining and complaining, God says to Moses, Moses, go over and speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. And what does he do? He takes the rod, and he hits, bam, bam, and struck the rock. The rod that had the almonds on it. They probably went flying everywhere. The rod that turned into a snake turned the, wa uh, the water to blood. This was to tell Moses he loves his people. And he gave an opportunity for Moses as he would write these first five books for the people to see the heart of God and the heart of Moses because, see, God's interest is not only for the nation of Israel, but it's for Moses and Aaron and each one of his sons and each one of the people on an individual basis, just like it is with us. God's interest is in the church, and I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about body of believers. 
God's interest is in that. But his more, he has more interest in you and me as individuals who will fellowship with him, who will spend time in his word to be taught by the Holy Spirit to grow so that you become more and more in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's God's interest. Verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, and on one side and on the other side they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So this, he wrote it with his hand. He wrote it into these two tablets of stone, the work of God. It was engraved by God on these two tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the noise of the shout of victory nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So as they're coming down, Joshua's saying there's noise like there's a war. And Moses knew what it was. Moses knew what it was. God told him, go down because of your people. They have corrupted themselves. Verse 19, so it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot and he cast the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And I bet you what's going through his head right now is I should have let him do it. I should have said, yeah, let's wipe them out. Let's start all over again. And he's probably going to say that for the next 39 and a half years. Verse 20, then he took the calf which they had made, he burned it in the fire, ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and he made the children of Israel drink it. So if your God can be done, any of those one or two or three or four of those things, he's not a God. Uh, verse 21, and Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? Now look at who he's, look at what he said. What did these people do to you that you brought this sin on them? Remember, he was a leader. He was the one in charge for the 46 days that he was up on the mountain. And he did a terrible job. He made this, instead of saying, no, we can't do that. Our God is right there. You heard him. You heard him speak from the mountains. You saw all the things that he did with the, with the water, uh, with the frogs, with the lice, with the flies, with the cattle, with the locusts. The day of total darkness. All these things that God did. He saved you. You put the blood on the lentils and the posts. And he saved you. This is your God, the God that you were afraid of, that said, was speaking to you and giving you his law. And you said, no, Moses, let him tell you. And you tell us. But no, he gave in. He caved in. And the people wanting to follow an idol wanting to follow something that they made with their own hands. And you know, if Aaron would have carved the look-alike of himself, they would have followed that. Because that's how we are. It's in Aaron and us to see something. It's not walking by faith. It's we got to see it in order to believe it. And that's the wrong idea. Believing in what God can do is what we all need. And in verse 21, and Moses said to Aaron, oh, I'm sorry, I read that, verse 22. So Aaron said, 
Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, they, that they are set on evil. So he's, saying, he's, he's throwing the blame back on them. Well, you know these people, they were really getting at me. You know, they did it to you in the day. You know, this, this, all, the, all this time that we got to Mount Sinai, they've been doing it to you. They complained about not having food. Then they complained about the food they were getting. They complained about the water was bitter. Then they complained because uh, they didn't have enough water. And the whole time, they did nothing but complain. They, they were at the Red Sea. Uh, they saw all the miracles that God did. They're at the Red Sea, and all they're doing, oh, you, God brought us here to die. Why here? We could have been died back there. Why not? But they, they were complaining, and this is what he's saying. You know how these people are. They are set on evil. So he's not taking responsibility at all. And remember, this is the high priest that God was telling Moses, this is what you're going to do. You're going to consecrate him. You're going to put him in this garb, and he's going to come before me one day a year. This guy right here. Moses now has got to be thinking, I think the Lord's off his rocker. Verse 23, For they said to me, Make us gods, true, that shall go before us, as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, they're still stuck on that, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and this calf jumped out. Woohoo! What a miracle. Hallelujah! Oh, man, you, we, we just threw it in there. We pulled off the jewelry and tossed it in there, and boom, here it comes. It must be God. What a liar. Verse 25, now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. So it's a showdown. Okay, everybody that's on my side, being Moses, come over here. Do you want to worship the calf? There you go. You can go over there. Actually, the calf was gone by then. <clears throat> Verse 27, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from the entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So these people who chose to be outside... That's exactly what happened to them. They were outside, and they were executed by the Levites. Anyone from the family of the Levites, they put on their sword and killed them. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. For every man has opposed his son and his brother. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. He, Moses is going to stand in the gap or attempt to stand in the gap for the nation of Israel. He says to them, they committed a great sin, and I'm going to go up and make atonement for you. But this atonement is just a covering it's not the atonement, that Je the blood of Jesus Christ. This is like the animal. And what Moses is saying here is, uh, let me be the sacrifice for the nation. Verse 31, then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold, <clears throat> like he didn't know. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, block me out of your book, which you have written. So he's saying, okay, if you don't want to forgive these people, then just take me right out. Let me be the sacrifice, the atonement for them, which reminds you of who? Jesus. So let's turn to First Peter. It's right after the book of James, which is after Hebrews in the New Testament. Uh, chapter 3, 
And in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now turn back a couple of books to, or six or seven, back to 2 Corinthians. It's in chapter 2. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, it's, cha it's verse 5. Or chapter, uh, chapter 5. And in verse 21, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin, for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, remember, we talked about how Moses was a type of Christ. And see, it's only through Jesus' blood that we can have atonement for our sins. Although Moses' heart might have been in the right place, saying that uh, it blot me out of the book if you won't forgive them. But God says to him in verse 33, and the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore, go, go lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they had did with the calf, which Aaron made. That's kind of interesting. He speaks of this plague, but there is no uh, other, other thing adding to it. The, there's no scripture to look at. But what ends up happening and what this plague could be and this punishment is remember in just a very short period of time, anyone from over the age of 20 will not enter the promised land because of the sin of the people. So only because, they, remember, they get to the promised land, they send spies in there, and the spies look in, and they say, oh, there's giants in the land. Ten of them do. There's two of them that don't, Joshua and her. Caleb, thank you. Anyway, so they go in, and so that Caleb and Joshua want them to, let's go, let's conquer. God's going to do it. He brought us here. He's going to clear the land for us. Remember, he said that I will send my angel before you to put the fear in them, which 40 years later, when they go, that's exactly what happens. But see, he will visit them. You know, people today think that because they're sinning and they're getting away with it and God's not doing anything, that it's okay. It's okay with God. Well, you know, God must like the fact that we're not married and we're sleeping together. And oh, you know, hey, uh, God doesn't seem to mind that I take these drugs or get drunk or cheat on my wife or lie or steal, because God hasn't done anything. What's, you know, where is God? But see, God is a God of grace, and sometimes he'll allow us to do that so that we hit rock bottom, so that we realize the difference between the fellowship that we have with him, the love that's in our hearts when we fellowship with him, and the fellowship of the world which does us no good, which might satisfy us for a short period of time. But the bottom line is, is, for you and me as believers, it will never satisfy us, or it should never satisfy us. And if we sit here today and we're struggling with some things, and, we're, and, and I know everybody does. Uh, I hear it. People struggle. We all do. And I know I struggle. And when we do struggle and we do fall, we need to get back up and we need to repent, turn the other way and jump, leap, 
as fast as you possibly can back into the arms of the Lord where there's safety and there's refreshment for our sin. And tomorrow as you go out and you sin, I hope you remember this. God's idea is to fellowship with you, but if you sin, he can't fellowship with you. And we're going to see next week, Moses is going to be outside the camp where he's going to meet the Lord. How sad. So he meets the Lord over there. And I hope that that's not the way it is for us. I hope we didn't come here today because we feel out of fellowship with the Lord because our sin is in the way. And we came here today hoping to be refreshed. But you need to do that in your heart. It's between you and him. And then we can come alongside you and bear hug you and tell you how much we love you. Which the Lord is the one that would put that in our heart. And that would be him saying that to you. So I ask you today, if you have sin in your heart, if you have something that you're struggling with, let it go. Repent. Turn the other way. Walk away from it. And get back into the relationship that God wants to have with you every day. Don't be like Israel. Wait on the Lord. And if you are struggling and you're having troubles or you don't feel good or whatever, we're always up here for prayer. I know I say that and very few people come, which could be a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. And I'll tell you why it's a bad thing, because a praying church is so much more effective than one that does not. Because I can guarantee you that each one of you in this room have had the Lord answer your prayer over and over and over. Am I wrong? So I'm right. So that is true. So why we would not go before the Lord and ask him to help us, I don't know. But we're a stubborn and stiff-necked people, right? Actually, he was talking about Israel. We're a peculiar people. We're set apart. We're holy. We're just. We're priests. Kings. Thanks, Mike. That's how God looks at you. But don't ruin that fellowship. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word tonight, Lord. And I just ask that, that Lord, you just pour your spirit on each one of us 24-7, Lord, because we so need it. Father, we thank you that your word pierces our heart, teaches us, gives us an understanding of who you are and how you are, Lord. Father, I ask that if any of us here need to hear from you, Lord, I ask that you, that you speak with them, that you be with them. Lord, comfort those that need comforting. Continue to chase after those that are sinning, Lord. And continue to fellowship with those that want to fellowship with you. Father, we love you and we thank you and we look forward to the wonderful things you're going to do in each one of our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.